Hi there. Welcome back to Bush History. I'm David Bush. And today's topic has to do with the Roaring Twenties. And you notice I have Roaring with quotes around it. Air quotes, if you like, today. Anyway, the Roaring Twenties. Why do they call it the Roaring Twenties? Well, let's think about this a little bit. Um, women got the right to vote. World War I was over. A lot of uh, men have come home from the war and they're making families and they're nesting. Families are growing in the United States. We didn't sign the Treaty of Versailles, so there's this feeling of we're out of any problems of the world. Uh, a lot of money was made during the war. A lot of wealthy people started to show their, their uh, wealth in the streets in the United States and you had this whole idea of conspicuous consumption again. With women's suffrage, you have this newfound um, culture that women are fueling. They have the right to vote, and with that they are starting to get involved in other things in society and get out there, so to speak. Prohibition, prohibition is kind of interesting because uh, prohibition has also fueled new behaviors for women. Let's just back up a little bit. When, um, when women got the right to vote, there was a thought that that would change the political spectrum in the United, Ch in the United States and it would cause a new look at politics. But the funny thing about women getting the right to vote was for the most part women voted like their husbands did. So we just doubled the numbers. We didn't really change uh, the voting outcome. But nevertheless, nevertheless there's a feeling of empowerment. So we have the 18th Amendment which was prohibition known as the Volstead Act. We have the 19th Amendment which is women's suffrage. And the 18th Amendment is in 1919, and the 19th Amendment is in 1920. It's an easy way to remember 18 and 19, 19 and 20. We are at relative peace because we're not involved in what's going on in the world, and we've all turned inward. With the election of Warren G. Harding in the 1920 election, taking office in 1921, we have this return to normalcy. Well, normalcy means what? Well, for the majority of Americans, normalcy meant the last Republican decade, which was the 1890s. The 1920s is going to be the next Republican decade, dominated by the presidencies of Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover. And what that would mean is a deregulation, a more business favorable climate. So during the 1920s, business was able to act pretty much with impunity. And the money that had been made during World War I is now being thrown around in the economy. So that's part of where this Roaring Twenties comes from. And women, women feeling this newfound power that came from you know, the right to vote with the 19th Amendment, they're also feeling that they can be a lot more involved in society. And prohibition was an interesting one because the whole idea of prohibition, the outlawing of the sale and manufacture of a distribution, of alcohol was kind of interesting because it didn't mention consumption. So if you could find a way to get it, you could drink it as long as you didn't buy it, as long as you didn't sell it, as long as you didn't produce it, as long as you didn't distribute it. If you could have it in your hand, it wasn't really illegal. And of course, that gave, uh, that gave birth to all of those speakeasies, those illegal saloons where you paid an admission, a cover charge at the door. And that cover charge simply meant someone was covering the door while you went inside and you drank. For now, nothing out of your pocket. So it was kind of a gray look at the law. But also during the 1920s, we had very restrictive immigration as a result of the Russian Revolution. So we didn't want a lot of new people coming into the United States. By the time we hit 1925, the Klan is at an all-time high. 500,000 estimated members in 1925, which is actually pretty amazing. Oh, by the way, about prohibition, with the outlaw of the manufacture of liquor, that meant farmers were going to take a big hit because they had been, they had been producing the grain that was used in the manufacture of primarily beer. So that was going to, uh, to cause a problem for farmers. They'd been producing a lot during the war and they're not going to produce so much during the 1920s any longer. The government isn't buying their products, not to the extent they were during World War I for sure and they're not selling to breweries, so that's going to be a problem. Immigration, you're not really welcome in the United States at this point in time. Very restrictive immigration laws during the 1920s. 
and Lord knows you didn't want any political views that differed with the norm. That's the whole Sacco and Vanzetti thing. Sacco and Vanzetti are going to be executed for a crime. Um, a heist and murder in Braintree, uh, Massachusetts, of an armored car crew. They, you know, stealing the, the money from the armored car and killing the uh, killing the guards. They're going to be executed. And the only thing that held them, or connected them, if you like, to the crime was that they happened to own the same kind of gun. And there were no ballistics tests like we have in the, in the modern era. So they simply owned the same kind of gun. All kinds of alibis supporting the fact that they couldn't have done it, but they were executed anyway because they were socialists, they didn't speak English, and there was this collective fear in the United States. So that's going on. So think about this. Farmers are suffering. There's this whole anti-immigrant wave. The Klan is on a rise. And by the way, that roaring part, that roaring part was if you were one of the rich white guys who had the money. Because there was this huge unequal distribution of wealth going Let's take a closer look now at what's happening in the 1920s. Let me cue up this PowerPoint. The so-called Roaring Twenties. Well, it roared. It roared if you were the right person with the right resources. And if you weren't, you unfortunately suffered greatly during the 1920s. I'm going to remain off camera as I present this PowerPoint just as a way of trying something new. The Second Industrial Revolution, sometimes that term is used to describe the incredible output and innovation that occurred as a result of World War I. 70% of the factories now had electricity, and that meant the factories could remain open longer and produce more. Also, there's a building boom that occurs as a result of the baby boom with soldiers coming home from World War I, and that's causing a tremendous increase in demand, which is fueling output. And because of that increased demand and output, commercial banks are investing a good deal of money in the modern corporation. If you think about that, those banks now exist not just to save money, but they exist to invest. The modern corporation is a sprawling complex that costs a lot of money to develop and a lot of money to maintain. I wanted to leave this picture minus any words on it so you could actually see what these look like. Think about the amount of people that a place like this could employ. And obviously the comment on the right hand side that uh, I removed the picture so we could see, I removed the text I should say, so we could see what's exactly on the slide. The father of all of this, or the fathers, are John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie with the great business advances of the late 1800s. The modern versions are people like Alfred Sloan and Owen Young as they're developing the corporations of the 20th century. They're using vertical integration, which is when a corporation controls an entire process, as opposed to horizontal integration, which is when a corporation seeks to control the market. They'd like to do that, but that's illegal now. You also have these new philosophies of industry where scientists and specialists study motion, they study time, and they start to time the assembly lines, and they start to adjust the work area to better suit how people moved, thereby trying to increase their productivity as much as possible. In an effort to combat the growing union, the American Federation of Labor, businesses developed something known as welfare capitalism. Welfare capitalism simply meant that a business would entice a worker through a series of benefits. Sometimes those benefits were health insurance. Sometimes those benefits were pensions. Sometimes those benefits were cafeterias on location so workers could actually eat and get their meals at the workplace. This was the grandfather, if you like, of the modern benefits packages. And you could see why it might encourage some people not to join the union. Henry Ford, Henry Ford was such an incredible pioneer. His main contribution was the assembly line in his Ford factories. We understand that, but he also did other unique things. The assembly line increased productivity, which meant he built more cars, which meant the cars that he built could be cheaper, so more people could buy them. He also increased wages 
and cut hours. So he paid his workers better and they worked less. Think how popular he'd be because of that. Another thing, another advent of his was he encouraged the employment of a good deal of immigrants and African Americans. When they couldn't find skilled jobs in other places, they were able to find jobs with Ford. So Ford was an incredible pioneer. Not only did he make automobiles more affordable, he made a happier workplace and a more diverse workplace. Agriculture is going to suffer incredibly. During the war, the United States government was the primary purchaser, the primary consumer of agricultural goods to help the war effort. And prior to prohibition, a good deal of the wheat and farm crops were used in the production of beer. Well, with the end of World War I and with the advent of Prohibition, the two huge consumers for agricultural products disappeared. What didn't happen was that farm production did not drop. Farm production increased because the same innovations that could be used in the factory could also apply on a farm as machinery took the place of manual labor. So farm output stayed high, and there was nothing the farmers could do about it because the farmers had gone into debt. They bought a lot of machinery to increase their output, and they owed the banks monies. So now, farmers had no choice but to keep producing to pay the banks, and the more they produced, the more prices dropped. It was a terrible cycle, and the McNary-Haugen bills were an attempt to combat that cycle. The United States government bought up farm surplus in an attempt to keep prices higher to keep the farmers in business. This sounds like a replay of the whole populist problems of the late 1800s. Culture has expanded. There's actually a new culture. Journalism is part of that culture as people are able to read about new things and advertising occurs in journalism. But journalism has now expanded from just news stories to sporting events, to advertising with a lot of new fashion ideas for women and a lot of new inventions that can be purchased for the home. We're starting to hear more about African Americans in sports. So culture is really expanding incredibly. You can't talk about the 1920s without talking about Prohibition and Al Capone. We all know about Prohibition, but just because you outlawed liquor didn't mean people wouldn't find a way to get it. And Al Capone would be the person who would find a way to provide it. And through his attempts to provide liquor and his success in providing that liquor, we have the birth of organized crime and everything that goes along with it. So prohibition hurt the farmers and increased crime, which is exactly the opposite of the effect that all the temperance movements thought occur. An example of the corruption during the 1920s was the Harding administration. Warren G. Harding became president in 1921 with a promise to return to normalcy, to return to the days of the 1890s and Republican philosophies of laissez-faire and business. And yes, that was going to happen. What was also going to happen with that laissez-faire was you were going to get corruption. Not that Harding himself was ever thought to be corrupt, but seemed to be everybody around him was. Um, General Dougherty, a top advisor, took bribes to look the other way for people who were breaking the prohibition laws. Albert Fall, his Secretary of the Interior, was instrumental in a scam where government oil reserves in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, were being leased to the Mammoth Oil Company for a dollar an acre. And then the Mammoth Oil Company was pumping the oil and selling on the open market, essentially selling government oil. Albert Fall took the blame for the whole thing, and that's where we get the expression, the Fall Guy. When Harding dies in 1923, after a heart attack, Calvin Coolidge becomes president. And he continues a lot of the similar Republican policies of laissez-faire. He cuts federal spending. If you cut federal spending, you're going to increase unemployment because you're going to cut jobs. And he cuts taxes. So businesses are able to maintain more of the profits that, that they are developing during the, uh, during the time period. An interesting piece of legislation there's an international treaty called the Kellogg-Briand Pact that would then be ratified by the United States Senate. And the Kellogg-Briand Pact outlawed war. A nice idea. Let's outlaw war. We know it actually isn't going to work, but they're going to try it anyway. 
Herbert Hoover becomes president after Calvin Coolidge and is probably one of the unluckiest presidents in American history. He becomes president at the dawn of the Great Depression. He's inaugurated in March, and in October of 1929, we have the Great Depression. And because he is a Republican, he is a non-interventionist. He doesn't want to interfere. He believes in laissez-faire. One of the things he does do after a while, realizing the government has to do something, is he passes the Emergency Relief and Construction Act. And what that does, it sets up the, Re the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And the Reconstruction Finance Corporation is going to make loans to businesses. The, the theory is that loans will be made to business, business will expand and hire more workers. The problem is business doesn't want to expand. People aren't buying the products anyway. One of the problems in the Great Depression is a lack of money. So by increasing production, that doesn't mean you're going to increase consumption. And the other part of that is corporations didn't use the money to hire more workers. They used the money to pay off their debts. So it was a failed idea. It was an example of what was called trickle-down economics, which will be explained more in the next presentation, in presentation 20. Another side effect of the economic decline was inability to pay debts. If you remember the whole Treaty of Versailles and what accompanied it was, Germany owed the rest of Europe war reparations. And Europe owed the United States a good deal of money from loans during the war. Both of those dried up with the fall of the economy in the late 1920s. So people weren't able to pay, not only domestically, but internationally, and the flow of money is going to reach a screeching halt. Something seemingly unrelated, but very related in reality, is this fear of foreigners. After the Russian Revolution in 1917, there was a uh, clapdown, or a clampdown, if you want, on immigration into the country. We had what were called the Palmer Raids. The Palmer Raids were raids against people who thought they would be practicing un-American activities, specifically against communists and socialists. And immigration was tightened up as well. The Chinese Exclusion Act was still in effect, so nobody's coming in from China, but now we're trying to limit people coming in from Eastern Asia completely, not just the Chinese. An example of these kinds of feelings were was the Sakura and Vanzetti case. When Sakura and Vanzetti were executed for um, knocking over an armored car in Braintree, Massachusetts and killing the driver, but the reality was the only evidence was a gun that Sakura and Vanzetti owned. I forget which one owned the gun. That was the same kind of gun used in the robbery. There were all kinds of alibis that they didn't do it and that they were someplace else, but it didn't matter. This hysteria, this anti-Eastern hysteria was gripping the United States. It occurs again in the 1950s with the second Red Scare, but nevertheless, that fueled this restriction of immigration. There was an explosion of culture and the arts coming from African Americans. It was called the Harlem Renaissance. You had jazz, you had poetry, you had investments in business by major players in the African American community. So we have the birth of jazz uh, as part of the Roaring Twenties as well. An interesting sidebar was African Americans could play for white audiences in the central part of cities. But they couldn't get off the stage and eat and drink with those audiences. And white musicians could not play with black musicians. The expression, take the A train, and the tune comes from exactly that idea. Um, when black musicians were done playing in Manhattan, in central Manhattan, they would go back to Harlem, which was a, uh, a black concentration in northern Manhattan. And white musicians would get on the A train and go up and play with them. So it was very interesting. It was the, the dawn, if you like, of modern African-American culture. So let's just look at this chart together. And just as another way of looking at the same information in a very specific bulleted way. Politics. In 1919, we have the 18th Amendment, and that prohibited the sale, manufacture, and distribution of alcoholic beverages. And of course, what's left out of that is consumption. We know that's going to be a big problem. 
which gave women the right to vote, and women are now going to feel like they're more players in American politics and society, and they are. But again, the strange thing is they vote like their husbands voted. We have immigration quotas in the 1920, where we think that the Russian Revolution could spread. There's a collective fear of that, so let's keep people out of the United States. The Klan grows stronger, 500,000 people by the middle of the 1920s, and Teapot Dome. Teapot Dome is in Wyoming, it was a government oil reserve, and during the Harding presidency, uh, it was leased to private individuals, the Mammoth Oil Company, which was a cousin of Standard Oil in the day, and it was leased at a dollar an acre, and it was oil that had been designated for the Navy that's now being sold into the public sphere, and the Mammoth Oil Company is going to make all kinds of money out of that. We have entertainment. Entertainment is taking off in the 1920s with this whole idea of jazz. Jazz, the new kind of music. You can stomp your foot to it, you can dance to it. It was dominated by black musicians. Black musicians could perform for white audiences, but they couldn't mingle in front of the stage and they couldn't sit down at tables within the white audience, but they could be on stage with them. However, you couldn't have black and white musicians playing together. So white musicians would go up to Harlem, hence take the A-Train, because the A-Train went from 59th Street to 125th Street in Manhattan, which was from the middle of Manhattan to Harlem. Black poetry becomes very important, and Langston Hughes as an example. You have the first talking movie called The Jazz Singer with Al Jolson in black face, because it was thought that people wouldn't pay to see a black man, so he is a white guy with a black face in this movie. There's more to it than that, but that's the juxtaposition. it. Sports is coming along because there's more leisure time. With Ford's assembly line, people don't have to work as long hours, not to say that people don't, but leisure time is developing. Babe Ruth is the man of the hour in the 1920s for the New York Yankees, and radio, the Radio Corporation of America, is starting to dominate American entertainment. It's no longer just a tool for sending information. Now you have radio shows and people gather and they would listen to these radio shows on a regular basis. As we discussed earlier, just to hit it again, the assembly line and the Model T dominating how America is going to do business. Look at this. In 1919, there are 7 million cars on the roads in the United States. By the time we get 1929, 23 million cars. Also, not only are we simply producing cars, we're producing all kinds of stuff for the home. There's a baby boom going on, especially in the early part of 1920. Soldiers coming home from war. Soldiers getting married. Soldiers making babies. And what are they doing? They're buying stuff for their homes. And something new called installment buying, where you can buy something today and pay for it later. You would sign your name in a department store, and they would set up a payment schedule, and you would pay later. Now think about the potential problem with that when people don't understand how that's going to work. Aviation, we're starting to fly. Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. So he's an American hero. And then we get Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart, she becomes the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. So it's an amazing time in the United States. Things are going well for some. Anyway, I'm going to leave this presentation here at 1901. And I'm going to get ready to present 192. And you'll take a look at that. And it's a very personal look at how the 1920s is going to end and actually how we get into the Great Depression. So until next time, this is David Bush with Bush History, and I'll see you soon. Take care.